Good evening, and welcome to this evening's presentation, Prophetic Insights, here at Save to Serve, Prophesy Again. As I watch that video again, it is fitting for what we're now doing in this series, going over the chapters in the book, The Great Controversy, addressing and seeing those applications as the world is planning to bring an end to the Protestant Reformation. God needs men today, like the reformers of old, to let the world know the Reformation is not over. Amen. There are still faithful and true Protestants today. Uh, before we begin, I hope you have your book, uh, The Great Controversy, your Bibles, your writing instruments, your notepads. And before we begin, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we thank you this evening for your many blessings. It's a privilege to bow in your presence, to come humbly to study your words. Lead and guide. Forgive us of our sins. Lay upon us a burden for our own salvation and the salvation of others. Bless us now, we pray. Let there be no hindrance to the study of your word this evening. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Tonight we will be looking at chapter 8 of the Great Controversy, Luther Before the Diet. And I hope that you all have prepared yourselves by reading and studying the chapter. If not, it's never too late. After the broadcast, you can always go back and reread, restudy the chapter. And as we have been saying time and time again, these early chapters aren't just recounting history, mm. but they're also showing us what is to be expected in these last days. It's showing us the unfolding of events leading up to the second coming of Jesus. But of course, before the second of coming of Jesus, we know that the crisis, the mark of the beast crisis, must take place. And last week, a uh, pastor was sharing with us something significant about these first eight chapters in the Great Controversy. And we didn't have time to really unpack it as we would have liked to, so we're just going to uh, reiterate what was shared last week in case you missed it. I'm going to ask you at this time to get your writing instruments on your notepads and take, this no take down these notes. Draw this diagram, if you can, on your sheet of paper. This, this chart covers the earlier chapters in the book, The Great Controversy. As Hillary just laid out, these earlier chapters, they typify the experience that will lead up to the Sunday Law Crisis and the experience during the Sunday Law Crisis. Let's take a look at these first eight chapters. What are these first eight chapters that we find in the book, Great Controversy. On your screen, you find the eight chapters. Let's, let's list these eight chapters. Hillary? Okay, chapter one, the destruction of Jerusalem. Two, persecution in the first centuries. Three, era of spiritual darkness. Chapter four, the Waldenses. Chapter five, John Wycliffe. Chapter six, Huss and Jerome. Chapter seven, Luther's separation from Rome. And chapter eight, Luther before the diet. These eight chapters lay out and typify the experience of God's people in the last days. Let's take a look again at these eight chapters. Because firstly, we want a pivot point, a point from which everything else revolve. Now, based on these eight chapters, again, they typify the experience of God's people in the last days. Where are we in light of these eight chapters? Where are we, Hillary? Well, we would be about in chapter three, the era of spiritual darkness, the repetition, rather, of the era of spiritual darkness. We're right here. And notice, the reason why we can confirm that we are right in, right here between chapter two and chapter three, the persecution in the first centuries and the era of spiritual darkness, this is our point of pivot. If you notice, we are hearing nowadays that there is a, uh, massacres happening in the Far East, in Syria, in other countries, in Africa, in the Middle East, how Christians are being murdered. And we have men of influence who are now saying that we have come to a repetition 
of the persecutions of Christians in the first centuries. That's right. And they're also saying the persecutions of Christians today, many more are dying today as it was during the first centuries. Wow. Now notice here, look carefully. This is uh, Diocletian, one of the Roman emperors. And based on this historical record, again, I'm scanning through this, based on this historical record, it states that Diocletian killed over, over 20,000 Christians during his reign. First centuries, time period, he reigned from 284 to 305 AD. Look at this now. Here we have it. I'm going to run through this rather quickly. Right there on the screen showing that Christians are being martyred therein or being killed, I should say, there in Iraq. And here we have it. Newsweek, a new exodus, Christians fleeing from persecution. Won't spend much time on that. Look at the contrast now. June 18th, 2015, we read under Emperor Diocletian, mm -hmm. approximately 20,000 Christians lost their lives. Right. What do we see here on the headline, Hillary? 60 million people fleeing chaotic lands, UN and, says. And notice, here we have December 27th, 2016. The headline reads, Church has more martyrs today than in the first centuries. So this is our pivot point now mm -hmm. in these eight chapters of the great controversy. So we know that we are now repeating which chapter? Chapter, chapter two. two. Persecution in the first centuries. Mm -hmm. Notice. And then we have from Mr. Trump, the president. He's also recounting the same statement. Brutal rise in persecution of Christians. And then we have the Pope of Rome, December 27th, 2016. Read that for us, Hillary, what it says here. Church has more martyrs today than in first centuries, Pope Francis says. So here we have it now. So we're seeing a repetition of chapter 2. And it's interesting that you're seeing both the dragon and the beast power saying the same thing. So The dragon and the beast? Yes. Fix that. Apostate Protestant America. We saw an article with Trump false talking prophet. about it. The false, yes, yes, the false prophet. Amen. And you also see the beast saying the same thing. Yes. So it's going to be these two entities to bring about the supposed solution. Amen. The dragon and the false prophet. Yes. Notice now. So let's get back to our chart. So since we are right here repeating chapter 2, persecution in the first centuries, what happened in chapter 3? To end persecution, what happened there? The Edict of Milan was issued under Emperor Constantine. And which chapter in these eight first chapters in the book Great Controversy specifically mentioned Constantine? Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing now the repetition of chapter 2 and chapter 3. The persecutions, now we're seeing a call for the Edict of Milan to be repeated. Notice. We're going through this. Here it is, my friends, the Edict of Milan. This is from the historical record by Emperor Constantine in the year 313 AD. And then we had the Pope of Rome just a few months ago stating that he wants a repetition of the Edict of Milan to bring about an end of persecution of Christians. Not only did the Pope say that, but even the leader of the Orthodox Church uh, Mr. Bartholomew, the bottom paragraph in red words, which began to manifest itself with the freedom for the Christian faith following the Edict of Milan. So we're seeing it now. Mm -hmm. So this is chapter 3 in the book Great Controversy being repeated. Right. Constantine, but what else did Constantine do? in that time period of chapter three in the book, Great Controversy. Right, he also issued the first uh, compulsory Sunday law. So we see that the, the Edict of Milan prepared the way for him bringing in this Sunday law, which all men had to, had to honor. So that means since we're seeing the repetition of chapter two, mm -hmm. chapter three in the book, Great Controversy, Constantine issued the first compulsory Sunday law. Right. Who urged him to do such thing? It was the Roman Catholic Church. There it is on your screen. Great Controversy, page 53, top left. In Hillary. the early part of the fourth century, the Emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. 
He was urged to do this by the bishops of the church. So we're seeing now how the bishop of the Roman Catholic Church, the beast power, mm -hmm. urged the dragon power, the Roman Empire, to enforce this Sunday law. Right. And on the bottom right of your screen, this day in history, it's right there. On this day in the year 321, Constantine decreed the day of the sun as a day of rest. rest. So mm -hmm. we're seeing what's happening here. And we're told in the book, Great Controversy, page 60. This is in the third chapter of the book, The Era of Spiritual Darkness. We read the first sentence here. Hear what it says here. But the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. All right. So we're seeing now the noon of the papacy was what? The midnight for the world. So now, what does that mean? The noon of the papacy signaled and will signal again midnight for the world. Talk to us. Well, when the papacy rises to its highest peak, when it regains its power, its popularity, its dominion, that's when uh, the world will be at its midnight. That's the enforcement of the National Sunday Law. So are we seeing it now? A repetition of the papacy rising oh, to, yes. its, uh, to its popularity again. Mm -hmm. The noon of the papacy, midnight for the world, it's right there. And we have covered this. January 18, 2017, the papacy is regaining her favorability. Right. All right. Gaining her popularity. So what is about to transpire? It's right there on the screen. What is about to transpire? The a enforcing of the National Sunday Law. And is the Pope calling for a Sunday Law? He is. And the interesting thing, his popularity is rising not only among the Catholic Church, but it's rising, you know, amongst uh, the, na the national leaders, a presidents. Amen. Let's get back to our chart now. So we can see in the first eight chapters in the book, Great Controversy, so far, we are seeing that we are now repeating what two chapters? Persecution in the first centuries and the era of spiritual darkness. So we are right there because the Sunday law has not yet been enforced. Correct. So we are right here between chapter 2 and chapter 3 in the book Great Controversy. Mm -hmm. The Sunday law will be a repetition of chapter 3 in the book Great Controversy, an era of spiritual darkness. darkness. Now notice now. What is chapter 4 in the book, Great Controversy? The wall dances. The wall dances. So mm -hmm. once the Sunday law is enforced in these last days, who will the wall dances typify? Well, the faithful servants of God that will have to do their work, but they'll have to do it in obscurity. They'll have to flee, as did the wall dances, to the mountains, and then from there they would go covertly and uh, carry the message forward. And that's why above chapter 4 on your chart, you see in fine print, the warden says, as they evangelized covertly from rural districts, so when the Sunday law is enforced, God's saints have to do likewise. All right? Era of darkness yes. is Sunday law crisis. Warden says, which chapter follows the warden says chapter 4? John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe. And who was he? He was the morning star, the morning star of the Reformation. So who would he typify once the son the law is enforced? Well, he will typify those who can give the message openly. And of course, we know he translated the Bible, so yes. he gave people the word of God. That's it. So he was no longer really doing the work covertly yes. so much, but he was carrying forward the message openly. So you see a contrast in the work mm -hmm. between in the manner of working with the war dances and John Wycliffe. And John Wycliffe, of course, died from natural causes. Right. So some, when the Sunday law is enforced, some of God's people at that time, they will give the message, but have, but they will die. Natural mm -hmm. causes, all right? What chapter followed John Wycliffe? Huss and Jerome. Huss and Jerome. What was so significant about that chapter? Did Huss and Jerome stand before church and state? They did. What happened? They were condemned. Who would they represent? They would represent uh, those that stand before church and state. They're condemned to die, and they will be put to death, like John Huss and Jerome. So as John Huss and Jerome stood before church and state, and they were martyred, so when the Sunday law is enforced, God's people, some of them, will be brought before church and state, and some of them will be martyred. Right. Huss and Jerome. We need to Stephen put in. Stephen and 
Peter. Peter, all right, yes. wonderful. Go I ahead. was just going to say yes. that this isn't during Jacob's time of trouble. We need to make that distinction right now. This, this is, is during... a little time of trouble. Right. All right. So what? Which chapter is the seventh chapter after Hoss and Jerome now? Who do we Luther, have there? Luther's separation. Right there Rome. on the screen. Look at the screen right there. You have Luther's separation from Rome. All right. Mm -hmm. Talk to us now. What was so significant about Luther's separation from Rome? Well, Martin Luther. Who would he typify? He, of course, followed in the footsteps of John Wycliffe and also Hoss and Jerome. Yes. But he was giving the message openly. He openly condemned the sins of the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, we know he posted his 95 theses on the church door of Wittenberg, and he went about um, openly carrying forward the work of Reformation, calling people out of the apostate system of Roman Catholicism. So as he nailed those 95 theses on the church door of Wittenberg, exposing the sins of the papal church, right. he represents God's sins once the son of the law is in force, that, that Sister White says, the sins of Babylon will be laid mm -hmm. open, GC 606. Now, what else about Luther? Well, and also in laying open the sins of Babylon, he was calling people out. So this brings us in the application to Revelation 18. We know that the call is given to come out of her, my people. You know, he wasn't just saying, okay, these are the abuses and the yes. corruptions of the church and this is what's wrong with the indulgences. No, he said, you need to separate yourself and be separate from this, this system. And in chapter 7, we saw that how Luther's writings, messages, and the impact of his work, ministry, went to all yes. of the Amen. nations in Christendom. And that could not be done by a natural man. No. So that was done by the Spirit of God. So Luther represents a time period when the latter rain is poured out. And the loud cry given. God's mm -hmm. people are sealed and they give the, the loud, loud cry. cry. That's chapter 7, Luther's separation from Rome. Let's move on quickly. Mm -hmm. Chapter 8 now, which is entitled Luther Before, before the, the Diet. Dying. Did he stand before church and state? Yes, he did. And what happened there? Was he condemned to die? He was condemned but what to happened? die. Talk to us. Supernaturally, God preserved him, and he, he was not touched by so his who, enemies. So who would he represent once the son of the law is in force? Well, he would represent those who are giving the message, those who have to stand before church and state, those whom the death decree is pronounced upon, but who God delivers. The 144,000. I hear back there. Wonderful. Luther. And notice again, the contrast between Huss and Jerome brought before church and state, died as martyrs. Luther brought before church and state, yet was preserved. That's right. You see it now. So Luther would typify God's saints who were sealed, receive the latter rain, give the loud cry, call people out from error and apostasy, go through the time of trouble, mm -hmm. the great time of trouble. Correct. Do not see death and see the second coming of Jesus Christ. Praise the God. The first eight chapters. Yes. That's right. Now, Pastor, we uh, gave the applications for chapters two through uh, eight, but we didn't really touch on chapter one, oh. destruction of Jerusalem. So That's can right. you give us a, a synopsis of what that would represent for us today? Let's get back to our chart. So we saw clearly that we are between chapter two leading up to chapter three. Right in the first chapters in the Great Controversy. Chapter 1 is entitled? Destruction of Jerusalem. All right. Now, this typifies the professed people of God today. And there are many things that we looked at in that first chapter. Mm -hmm. Now, what were some of the things that were prominent in that time period? Well, basically, the rejection of the prophets. Christ had sent prophets, you know, consecutively, back to back to yes. back, killed all of the prophets until they killed John the Baptist and then killed Christ. So as a result of them rejecting the prophets and rejecting the message and rejecting Christ, you know, this was their sentence that was pronounced upon them. Their city would be destroyed. And what else? Talk to us. What else? Well, also, God gave some signs. He told them when they could expect the, de the destruction of Jerusalem, you know, and so he told them how they could escape it, how they could prepare for that time. And he said when in Luke, 20, Luke 19, 
When you shall see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, know that the desolation is nigh. It's time to flee. It's time to get out. And so, of course, we know Cestius. Cestius came down. He came down and surrounded the city, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. And those faithful people that were studying and recalled the words of Christ, they saw that as an opportunity. Yes. Let's go. Let's get out. They fled and they, they did not perish. We're told that not one Christian uh, died in the destruction of Jerusalem. But the majority lived in unbelief. Yes, they, they remained. And Cestius, he backed up. He didn't take the city. He didn't destroy the city. And they thought they had time. Year one passed, no more Roman army. Year two passed. But three and a half years later, Titus came down. Titus came down in AD 70 and besieged the city. So what's the application? So the application is that God has given us signs to look for, for when it's time for us to flee literally, and also, you know, prepare ourselves spiritually. And yet God's people are seeing the manifestations of the anti-type of Cestius coming, and they're living in unbelief. They are going to be overthrown in these last days. Unbelief are, of the prophets. Are we now seeing that leaders within the Seventh-day Adventist church rejecting God's messenger, even the writings of Ellen White. Look yes. at the screen right here. It's right there. In, 2015, in 2005, the resolution was voted by the General Conference stating that Sister White's writings can enrich but not define our faith and practice. So are we going to see a repetition then of the destruction of Jerusalem oh, yes. in a spiritual sense? Yes. The, the professed people of God being overthrown. Why? They rejected the writings of God, Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And in 2015, General Conference also voted that Sister White no longer the Lord's messenger. Her writings no longer authoritative hmm. in our church. It only speaks on prophetic points. Wow. So we know that we're living in the last days. Now, friends, let's move on quickly. Let's get into now chapter 8 in the book, The Great Controversy. The chapter entitled, Luther Standing Before the Diet. But before I go any further, did you comprehend the chart? Yeah. Did you? You saw that? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. All right. Go back over it. And even those online, go back over that chart. These are given to us so we can understand what will happen in these last days. Let's open up now with this paragraph in the book, Great Controversy, addressing type and anti-type, how Luther's ministry did not end the Reformation, all right? It only gave uh, impetus to the work, but God has called us to finish the Protestant, to complete the work of reform. Mm -hmm. Page 148, The Great Controversy. Hillary. The Reformation did not, as many suppose, end with Luther. It is to be continued to the close of this world's history. Luther had a great work to do in reflecting to others the light which God had permitted to shine upon him. Yet he did not receive all the light which was to be given to the world. From that time to this, New light has been continually shining upon the scriptures and new truths have been constantly unfolding. So now notice, let's take a look here. Let's, let's begin. So this chapter is entitled Luther Before the Diet. Mm -hmm. That means Luther was brought in a council. Yes. He, he stood before, he was summoned to come to stand before church leaders and state leaders to answer for his Faith. Right. And what we're seeing here is, as Luther stood before church and state to answer for his faith, who also stood before church and state to answer for the truth of God and his relationship with God? Who was this? Our great exemplar, Christ, Christ Jesus. So this chapter is showing us, as Luther stood before church and state, as Christ stood before church and state, we all will one day stand before church and and state, and this is going to be a reality. And some of the things that we will share with you this evening is going to literally convict and prick hearts. Mm -hmm. Look at Matthew 10 with me. Matthew chapter 10 is coming for us. We will also have to stand before church and state. Matthew 10, do you have it there, Hillary? Yes. Verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, 
and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Look at Luke 21. Go with me. Luke 21. So that means the experience and the account of Luther was fulfilling this prophetic word of Christ. Right. You'll be brought before church and state as a witness to give a testimony to the Gentiles. All right, Luke 21. Luke 21, and look now, let's begin with verse number 12. Hillary, verse 12, Luke 21. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Pause right there. Synagogues typify what? Church. Churches. Churches. And would they be brought into prisons? Oh, yes. From, watch this now, from the council to the prisons. Based on the first eight chapters in the book, Great Controversy, which men were brought into the councils and then brought to prison? Huss and Jerome. Wonderful. Huss mm -hmm. and Jerome. Beautiful. Read on. Verse 13, And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolk, kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. What can we grab from these verses? As it relates to not only, well, firstly, firstly, go back to verse number 15. It says carefully in verse 15, I will give you a mouth. I will give you wisdom, which all, that means all, mm -hmm. your adversaries shall not be able to do what? To gainsay to nor gainsay resist. To gainsay nor what? Nor resist. resist. What does gainsay mean? Deny. Exactly. Can't refute it. Exactly. And mm -hmm. as you saw when... When, when, when Pope present their champion oh, yes. to come and combat Martin Luther, could he gain say the word of Martin Luther? No, not so at all. that experience God is going to give to us, if faithful, in these last days. I want it. Do you want it, my friends? Oh, yes. Do you want this mm -hmm. online? All right. What else? You can't what? Resist. Mm -hmm. Did some accept the words of Luther? Yes. Many, yes. Many yes. Did. All right, mm -hmm. and verse 19, what can we say about verse 19? Because not only are we to stand before church and state and preach the word of God, teach God's word, but there's something going on in verse 19. Talk mm -hmm. to us. In your patience possess ye your souls. He was calm. He was not um, aggressive. He was not angry. He was not filled with rage. You know, he was very calm, he held his composure, and we're reminded again of Christ. You know, even as he's being beaten and spat upon and yes. so forth, they reviled him, as Peter says, he reviled, he reviled not again. He didn't even open his mouth, only at the appropriate times. And not only that, it's not only his demeanor outwardly, but even his thoughts, Christ's thoughts. In his thoughts, he weren't th wasn't thinking what he wanted to do to them, but he, he possessed his soul because he had that connection with the Father. Do I have that experience? I mean, do we have it? That means God must now send preliminary tests oh, yeah. to get us ready for that crisis. Because if we are harboring hate in our hearts, malice in our hearts, to family members who have wronged us, friends and co-workers, etc., how are we going to stand in a few moments from now? That's right. And Christ was more concerned with their salvation as they're there persecuting them. He's more grieved, you know, at the, these are souls that I'm going to die for and they're rejecting me. So he wasn't angry and filled mm. with wrath towards them. He was more so having pity. And I imagine that those were the thoughts of Martin Luther. He was just thinking to himself, wow, it's so clear. You know, why are you rejecting? No. So is this experience coming for God's people in the last days? Yes. Are we going to be brought before church and state? Look at the statement here. Review and Herald, December 18th, 1888, paragraph 12. It says this, it does not seem possible to us now that any should have to stand alone. Hmm. Don't forget that term. That any, that phrase, that any would have to stand alone. But if God has ever spoken by me, the time will come. Yeah. When we shall be brought before councils and before thousands for his name's sake, 
and each one mm. will have to give the reason of his faith. Then will come the what? The severest criticism upon every position that has been what? Taken for, the, for truth. the truth. Then we're told we need, because of this coming crisis, this eventuality, this reality, mm -hmm. we need. that we may know why we believe hmm. the doctrines we advocate. Yes. A very potent statement here. It is, and this also indicates that because we're going to have to stand alone before church and state, we need to study the experiences of Jesus and also Martin Luther so that we can yes. know how we are to stand. Yes. Notice now Luther's sentiments. He says here on page 146, 153, 165, it says this, it is not for me to decide whether my life or my death will contribute most to the salvation of all. You may expect everything from me except flight and recantation. Amen. Jared, go ahead. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Fly, I cannot, and still less retract, Hillary. Though they should kindle a fire all the way from Worms to Wittenberg, the flames of which reach to heaven, I would walk through it in the name of the Lord. I would appear before them. I would enter the jaws of this behemoth and break his teeth, confessing the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. The gospel of Christ cannot be preached without offense. Why then should the fear or apprehension of danger separate, separate, separate me from mm. the Lord and from the divine word, which alone is truth. No, I would rather give up my body, my blood, and my life. Wow. He realized that those are the things that Christ gave up, his body, his blood, and his life. Absolutely. Even in uh, Matthew 26, when, when he's at the Last Supper. But this reminds me, as you were emphasizing the word separate, 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 it brings to mind Romans chapter 8. You know, what can separate us from the love of God? And I just think it's powerful, so yes. we can go there to, at Romans chapter 8. And these are the last verses, beginning in verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? Yes. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And then the question is asked, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors, praise God, through him that loved us. Amen. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Praise the Lord. That's powerful. So these words have to be our sentiments. Yes. Because these were the words of Luther before, mm -hmm. before he was brought before church and state. This must be the very sentiments of our hearts. And notice, before he was brought before church and state, there was a specific announcement made against Luther. What was that? That Luther should be excommunicated. excommunicated. And he was. Yes. Look at this clearly, my friends. Page 146, Luther was excommunicated before he was brought before church and state. Who comes to your mind? Who, before they were brought before church and state, was also excommunicated from the church? Well, Christ was. Go to John chapter 11 with me, my friends. John chapter 11. It's a blessing when you see that the experience of the men of God was, a, was an antitype of Christ's experience. Mm -hmm. And this should also give us hope and encouragement. We have two witnesses, right. Christ and Luther. And it should also give us certainty because many of us doubt that this can ever happen to us. But we have you know, witnesses other than, other than Christ that this will indeed happen. Yes. And it's interesting how the world, uh, 
when I say word, not all, but the majority in Christendom are now talking about, let's look forward to October 31st, 2017. And their minds are on Luther, but not his experience. No, no. No, no, no. Not or his not, message. Not the messages he preached. See, no. No, 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 no. It's mm. all about destroying what Luther, under God's inspiration, established. So it's like a mockery. It's That's like it. disrespect to Martin That's Luther, really and truly. That's, That's it. Mm -hmm. And when we print the book Great Hope, and say this must take the place of the great controversy, we are just as guilty of destroying what Luther established as the men in Babylon are also guilty Even more of destroying. Guilty. Even, Even more because we have why? the testimony of Jesus. John chapter 11, verse 47 through verse 53, God's word says that before Christ was brought before church and state, Caiaphas said that it is uh, better. Expedient. Expedient. Mm -hmm. Okay, finish it. Oh, it is expedient that one man perish, that the whole, or that one man die, so that the whole nation does not perish. Same thing. Mm -hmm. And that means they excommunicated Christ. Right. Had nothing to do with him. And notice now, and this led to him being brought before church and state thereafter, and then he was what? Crucified. And notice now, my friends, the, 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 the Romish champion, Aleander, came down and he blasted Luther and the followers of Luther with various accusations. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we are emphasizing this is because the very same accusations that Aleander, uh, the Pope's mouthpiece, brought against Luther and the followers of the Reformation, those same accusations will be brought against faithful Bible-believing Christians, faithful Seventh-day Adventists in these last days. Right. So we must take our cue, learn from this, so we can stand in these last days. What were some of those accusations, false accusations, mm -hmm. that Aleander brought against Luther and the followers of the Reformation? Well, he said they were insolent. He said they were ignorant, you know, um, they were contemptuous, etc. And he also brought out the point that these men could not be led of God. It could not be God's movement because there were few. In number. In number. Mm -hmm. Look at the screen. That's Great Controversy, page 148, paragraph 2, paragraph 3. Let's go now. John chapter 7. I, mean, I saw some clear type and anti-type in the life of Luther, with the life of Christ. They call them unlearned, ignorant. It's the same false accusations same. that were brought against Christ and the apostles. Yes. Now, let me add, Christ was unlearned, but in what way? Unlearned in the ways of the world. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. But learned of his Father. Amen. Amen. John chapter 7. Yes, John 7. And look at verse 14. It says this, now above the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Hmm. Unlearn. Right. Acts and, chapter 4. Go there. Even, yes. I was going to say even John the Baptist. And we're told that if he would have gone through the schools, he would have been yes. unfitted for yes. his work yes. as a reformer. Yes. And that's Desire of Ages, page 101 mm -hmm. on Word. Yes. Uh, if he had gone to the schools of the rabbis, right. unfit, look unfit. with me. Here we are in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. It says this, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were what? Unlearned, Unlearned and, and what? Ignorant, ignorant men. men. Hmm. They marveled, but what happened next? And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. This must be our experience as Christ, as Peter and John. These accusations that were brought against God's reformers will be brought against us. And this was not, not the full scope of the false accusations. No. Look at this here. Look at this on page 147. Aleander labored with all the power and cunning at his command to secure Luther's what? Condemnation. Condemnation. Last phrase, accusing the reformer of what? Four things. Sedition, rebellion, impiety, and blasphemy. What comes to mind? These same accusations, false accusations, were also brought against whom? Against Christ. Against Christ and even against 
Paul, mm -hmm. Luke 23, go there with me. Luke 23, Luke 23. In other words, friends, these chapters in the book, Great Controversy, are really giving us a Bible study. That's right. Not so much on doctrine, we'll get to m many of that, not so much there, but the Bible study of what is coming and how to be ready spiritually. Amen. All right, Luke 23. Sedition, rebellion, impiety, and blasphemy. What do we find in verse 1 and verse 2? They said Christ was perverting the nation. Mm -hmm. Look with me. Go to Acts, Acts 24. In Acts 24 and verse number 5, what was said of Paul in Acts 24 and verse 5? And while we're going there, just remember, in Matthew 26, mm -hmm. I believe it's in verse 65 and verse 66, what, did, what false accusation, what false charge did they bring against Christ when he stood before Caiaphas, the high priest? Blasphemy. Right. Blasphemy, the very same words. All right. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter, what chapter? 24. Acts 24, verse 5. Hillary, what it says here? For we have found this man a pestilent fellow. That's it. And a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Let's move on. And then on page 148 in the book, Great Controversy, what are the false charge did they bring against Luther and the, and the followers? Aleander again, the Romish so-called champion. I call him Goliath. Every time I read this chapter, mm -hmm. when I see Aleander, I say Goliath. <laughs> He's Goliath. Amen. Move on. What do we find there in the blue words on top? Charge after charge, he hurled against Luther as what? As an enemy of the church and the state. What comes to mind there? Well, Christ was denounced as an enemy of the church and the state. A perverter of the nations, right. Luke 23, 1 and verse 2. Mm -hmm. And we're told in the book, Great Controversy, page 592, that those who honor God's seventh day Sabbath, especially... When the Sunday law is enforced, because again, going back to our chart, right. let me finish my point. Those who honor God's seventh-day Sabbath and reject the Sunday Sabbath, what will they also be styled as and also be called and labeled? Enemies of law and order. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Enemy of church and, and state. state. Let me go back to my statement now, which I was going to interject. The point here is Luther before the diet is chapter 8 which succeeds chapter 3, right. era of spiritual darkness. Mm -hmm. So that means Sunday law, chapter 3. And chapter 8, what is Luther called? An enemy of, of the church, church and, and the, the state. state. Look wow. at GC now, page 592. Do you see it now? Yes. Mm -hmm. You can see it now? Amen? GC 592, it says this, those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order. Read on, Hillary. As breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth, their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. All right. Notice now. So is, it, is it coming again for God's people? It is. And even in Christ's earthly ministry, we know that there was a crisis surrounding the keeping of the Sabbath. Of course, the Jews had added on man-made traditions to their Sabbath keeping. Yes, but as Christ was going about healing and doing his work on the Sabbath, Th those are some of the accusations that they brought against him, that he was a Sabbath, Sabbath keeper. And so, Sabbath. I'm sorry, a Sabbath breaker, that he was not keeping the Sabbath. So we see a parallel there. There was a crisis in Christ's day surrounding the Sabbath, and that was one of the charges that also eventually led to his crucifixion. He did not keep the Sabbath. And Christ says, what has happened to me will happen to my followers. We will be called what? The enemies, enemies of what? Law, law and, and order. order. Notice now, friends, again, breaking down the moral restraints of society. What is one reason for which the Sunday law will be enforced? On the basis of morality. All right, to we, bring back yes, morality. Go ahead. To bring back morality. Yeah, if we honor Sunday, we'll have God's you know, blessing and the morality will improve and and that's one of the reasons why it will be enforced. And that's and, Great Controversy 588. 
right? 87. 587, 87. yes. Let's move on. And now, as I read through this book, Great Controversy, this chapter, chapter 8, Luther before, before the Diet, God raised up a man by the name of Duke George of Sax Saxony, and he laid open Duke George of Saxony that laid open some sins against the Roman Catholic Church. And as I read that, I said, Lord have mercy upon our souls because those same sins are prevalent in Babylon. But what was it? can also mm. be found within this remnant movement, Seventh day Adventism. Go ahead. Right. I was going to say, before we make the application, it, the book brings out that he, what, what made it even more powerful was the fact that he wasn't even, he hated the Reformation. Yes. He wasn't even a supporter of the Reformation, yet his eyes were open wow. to see that the Roman Catholic Church was not of God. And as you were making the modern day application, we can see in the world, and many people, that aren't even Christians Can't know see. that the Roman Catholic Church is not of God. They see the, um, the sex abuse scandals and they see all of these involvement in genocides and so forth and all this money laundering and extortion and so on and so forth. And even with these apostate Protestant pastors, they see them as just being about money. They're preaching a prosperity gospel yes. to drive around in their fancy uh, Rolls Royce cars and whatever have you to buy their watches and their jewelry. So they, they don't want anything to do with it. So they can see and even expose some of the sins and the corruptions that are going on in the world. Here it is. This is on page 149. These, Hillary. These are some of the abuses that cry out against Rome. All shame has been put aside and their only object is money, money, money so that the preachers who should teach the truth utter nothing but falsehoods and are not only tolerated but rewarded because the greater their lies, the greater their gain. It is from this foul spring that such tainted waters flow. Yes. Debauchery stretches out the hand to avarice. Alas, it is the scandal caused by the clergy that hurls so many poor souls into eternal condemnation. A general reform must, must be, be effective. effective. In other words, the leaders were saying, it doesn't matter. Our main goal is for money to come into our churches. That's the point of the indulgences. That's it. And mm -hmm. the priests would continue to preach lies. Lies. Why? The objective is increase church membership to make sure money comes into the church. It is going on in Babylon, mm -hmm. in, in the papal church. It's going on in, in her daughters, the Baptists, the Church of God, the Pentecostals, you name them, Rick Warren and who? Jakes, uh, Osteen, uh, all uh, of the above. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of them. It's all about money. And that's why we have to give the trumpet a certain sound when Seventh-day Adventist pastors are doing similar. And that's keeping the people in this state of darkness because if people's eyes were open, they would see clearly for themselves an era of spiritual darkness. Now, I want to ask you a question. When that pastor in California, I believe, who invited a Catholic priest to stand in the pulpit, appel, mm -hmm. who yeah. to stand in the a Catholic priest to stand in a Seventh Day Adventist pulpit, what would that Catholic priest preach? Lies, right? Lies. His very, his very posture, his very presence, his clothes, his clothes. <laughs> All the above spells lies. Mm -hmm. And nothing happened to him. Whatever happened to that pastor, he's still preaching. All because as long as members still come into the churches and monies are placed in the coffers, the offering plate, the leaders, the conference leaders, the administrators, the union leaders, turn they turn a blind, a, bl a blind eye to that. It's all about money and church membership. Lies, lies, lies are being taught. Look at, at the screen right here. How is it that we have Keith Burton and others who contribute to the Sabbath school lesson guide who are allowing Jesuits to be quoted in our Sabbath school lesson guide? Mm -hmm. What can a Jesuit tell a Seventh-day Adventist? To go against God's law. That's the only thing they can tell them. Lies, 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 lies. What has happened to these men? 
They're they still are in their still, position. Exactly. And even promoted some time to higher positions. There it is. Quoting from Jesuits in the Sabbath school lesson guide, and we have covered this. I'm going somewhere with this. That's one more Jesuit they quoted from, Robert Spitzer, a Jesuit priest in the Sabbath school lesson guide. There it is again. Let's move on. How is it that a chaplain, a minister can stand up and preach? Nothing is wrong with Adam and Steve relationship in the pulpit. And the only thing that was done was the video was removed. But where is he right now? Still, still. still ministering to Seventh-day Adventists. Lies, lies, lies. All for money and increase of membership. Then we have Dwight Nelson, pioneer Seventh-day Adventist church on Andrews University campus. What did he say? That it was God, that Allah... The God of the Muslims, uh, let me sit up straight here. The God of the Muslims is the God of Christians. The God of Seventh-day Adventists. Is that true? Is that true? That's a lie. And they were shopping around his book, I think, earlier yes. uh, last week. God's dream last for you. year, right. And said that mm -hmm. it, it, it was God. So when you read Muhammad's um, biography, his history, Muhammad, right, Muhammad, right, the that prophet. it was it was God who who it was inspired. Gabriel. It was Gabriel. Let who me inspired. see something. Let me get yeah. my bearings. Yes, Hillary. It was Gabriel who. Which Gabriel is this? The same supposedly the same Gabriel that ministered to um, John the Baptist parents to Daniel. And the point wow. I'm driving home, you know, for, let me say it this way: what we are seeing here, we can stay for the next few weeks, few months, if life should, should continue. We haven't seen any apostasy yet. There's still more to come. Go back and read Ezekiel 8. What did God say to Ezekiel? Look, Ezekiel, there's more things, more horrible, more terrible, more egregious things you are going to see until verse 16, the son of the law. Right. When they turn their backs to God's temple and they face towards the east to worship the, the sun. sun. It's going to get worse until the sun, the law is enforced. That's not my point. Here's my point. The people have cried to their leaders. Nothing hasn't changed. That's why I'm telling you, Save to Serve International, the power is in the hands of the common people. The leaders are not going to do anything. Do you know why? It's all about money, money, money. Increase of church membership. That's all it's about. Position and status. They're mm -hmm. not going to do anything. But let me tell you something. If the people understood, oh, I can't go here. If the people understood the power was in their hand, and if they should say there's going to be a boycott, on this local level of our churches, I want to tell you something. They would get the attention of the leaders. And there would be two options, primary options for the leaders. Either they would have to remove that pastor or, and bring somebody who's living up to God's word or disband that whole church mm -hmm. and cut the losses now, I have seen within, you know, I can't go there. I can't go there. Let's get back to the screen right here. But the power is with the people. Let me just say this to cap it off, Hillary. I'm going to say this. Let me say this. We have come to a time within our local Adventist churches. We're in. Once upon a time, the majority of the common people in the pews on the local level were conservatives. Living up to God's standards. All right, And if they should make a stand, conference leaders and leaders in the union would have to make a change. All right, But not now today. The majority of our metropolitan churches in New York, right? Mm -hmm. Brooklyn, mm -hmm. Queens, and Manhattan, you name it. Orlando, name it. Miami. Texas, um, Houston, Miami. Angeles, you get Sacramento. the point now. Atlanta. The majority of the members in these local churches don't profess present truth. They profess the liberal agenda, the progressive movement. Nominal Adventism, That's basically. It. That's mm -hmm. it. So even if the common 
um, people who believe present truth should take a stand. They'd Guess be what? So few in number. They, they'd be pushed out. They would be cut off. Excommunicated. Exactly. And that's what's happening today. Exactly. You exactly. Know. Not change, my friends. And Sister White says now, in selected messages, book one, page 204, nothing will be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. Nothing, my friend. It's going through until the Sunday law. Then you will see a sifting and a shaking because this foundation is built upon sand and storm and tempest will sweep away the structure. That's why I am saying to save your souls, those of you who believe present truth, if you cannot find another local Seventh-day Adventist church to attend, I would stay home to save my soul and the soul of my children. Go back and read that second chapter in the book, Great Controversy. Back to the screen here. It says, who is this, my friends? Palm, uh, Michael Leno. And what did Michael Leno do? Had the Palm, screen, Palm Springs Gay Men's Choir singing and what at their church. And whatever happened to Michael Leno? Probably applauded and patted on the back. Look at this. In Avondale, January 21st, here is a professor saying the Bible does not condemn hmm. the LGBT movement. Wow. And what Sister White says, when ministers and teachers sacrifice religious principle in order to please a worldly, amusement-loving class, they should be considered unfaithful to their trust and should be discharged. What does that mean? They should be the, removed, fired. Fired, terminated, but nothing happens with these apostates. Why? It's all about money and church membership. Wow. I mean, what happened there in Hollywood? A I mean, I mean, we could spend the whole elder. night on this, my friends. I mean, what happened at Loma Linda University? Mm -hmm. Burning the Bible to to accept homosexuality. And what happened in Chico? Mm -hmm. A lesbian couple baptized into Chico Seventh-day Adventist Church. Whatever happened to Dan Song? Whatever happened? Come on, friends. Still there as far as we know. And what, and there, the most recent, the most recent, where is this? Seattle, Washington. With Pastor John McClarty. John McClarty. Mm -hmm. I mean, these abominations, whatever happened to these men? Nothing, my friends. Why? It's all about church membership, Money, 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 while they spew lies from the pulpit. Wait a minute. And you're telling me that we must tell people stay in the church? If you tell people stay in the church, Adventist churches, without a qualification, only sit where the leaders are following present truth. If you don't give any qualification, stay in the church, it means then the members must stay in the church of mm -hmm. John, John McClarty. McClarty. Right. And Mike We're Leno. in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Do you think Christ would say stay in a church where San Balat no. was the high priest? No, and Tobiah. Where Tobiah, based on Nehemiah's account? Come on, friends. Need less I go there, right? Mm -hmm. These men are afraid to call sin by its right name. Because they themselves want what? Money, 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 and influence. We must call sin by its right name. If we have a burden for souls, speak the truth. Mm -hmm. Speak the truth, my friend. Let's move on. Watch carefully. On page, yes. I was just going to say, but who's actually in a worse condition? The, those that allow this sin to take place without doing anything, without any repercussions, or those that are actually speaking the lies? are those that have the power to, to stop it, you know, to cut it off, while yet they're purportedly standing for a conservative agenda, you know, and saying what should be and this is the way it should be and get back to this and that, but not doing anything with it when it's in their power to do. Who's in a more uh, responsible position? When Luther was brought before church and state, they, this man, Aleander, um, the, the, the elector, had such boldness to bring Luther's writings and say, Luther, I'm going to give you two questions. Number one, are these your writings? 
And number two, do you plan to recant? That's right. page 155. What is the application here, Hillary? Well, the to bring the man's writings. Now, where is he now at this point? Before, before the diet, before right. church and state. And they brought his what? Writings. His writing. Two questions. Are these yours? Mm -hmm. And do you plan to recant? They had, been, they had been storing up his writings, but not for the right reason. They weren't studying them and praying over them, seeking, is this truth? They were storing them up to use as ammunition against Martin Luther. And so that brings to view surveillance. You know, I don't know yes. if you're planning to go to the application now, but the application would be when we are brought before church and state, uh, they're going to gather up writings, maybe Facebook posts, <laughs> sermons preached. Maybe. Yeah, Facebook no, no. posts, your Maybe. YouTube. Yeah, all of these things. They're going to bring up your history oh, and they're going to ask you, yes. are these things yes. yours? Did you actually say this? You know, and do you still believe this way? Yes. Yes. Eric Walsh. Yes. Yes. And before we go to Eric Walsh, because you're seeing it now, you're seeing it now. So number one in the world, we see surveillance and they are literally garnering, gathering everything we have ever taught and preached, mm -hmm. everything we have ever written. And one day we'll have to meet those writings and those sermons. But before we go to Eric Walsh, do you know, let's go back to Christ's life first. Mm -hmm. What was the accusation that was brought into the courthouse, church and state? What false accusations did they use as evidence to crucify Christ. What did they say he said? They used his words where they said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. Now, friend, when did Christ make that statement? Well, at the beginning of his earthly ministry. So this was in John chapter two. Mm -hmm. So three and a half years later. Wow, wow. Are you seeing this, my friends? Three and a half years later, after Christ made the statement in John chapter two, in John 2 and verse, verse 18 through verse 21, three and a half years later, wow. they brought those same words into the courthouse. Hmm. Now, 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 granted, they misapplied, right. misinterpreted, placed a false coloring on his words. Right. But the point here is three and a half years later, his words were brought back. And if that happened to Christ, happened to Luther, what, what, what would happen to us? The same. It happened to us as well. And even Wycliffe. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, you said Eric Walsh. God must be moving. Look at the screen right there. What happened to Eric Walsh, a Seventh-day Adventist? What happened to him? Hmm? Well, he had this job with the state at public health director in California, and they came across somehow some sermons that he had preached where he was denouncing the LGBT lifestyle as being unbiblical. And he also had talked about spiritualism in Disney and so on and so forth. And once uh, people got a hold of those messages, there was an outcry. He, I believe he was invited to speak at a college. They dug up all of that information, and by and by, he lost his job. Mm -hmm. As and, a result. And on that chart, it says, now as a part of that lawsuit, the state of Georgia, which ironically claims it did not fire Walsh for what? Religious reasons. Is demanding he hand over what now? Religious documents. His most intimate private sermon notes along with sermons themselves. Why would they ask for those things to be turned over? To be brought where? To the court. In, into, into the, the courts. Court. Mm -hmm. To be accepted as evidence is against, against him. him. Right. Friends, if we're seeing this today, why are we not being awakened? Right. I mean, God is using Eric Walsh as a type of what's coming in the last days. And it happened to him twice because it happened to him in California. Then he got another job in Georgia and it happened again. He lost that job as well. Now, notice, as Luther now, friends, that's why we must know what we believe, my friend. Know what we believe is coming for us. And that's why, friends, you know, people always say, for example, Pastor, I hear you're saying this. The church is Babylon. I, I responded to one person, which I normally don't do. I said, listen, I have over approximately, I have these, these amount of sermons on YouTube on my website, okay? 
and we have written countless, numerous articles. Show me one statement where I ever said that. In other words, the evidences are there. But let me tell you something. Even if you don't say the error that they are accusing you of, they are going to misconstrue your words. Put a false coloring. Mm -hmm. Is it coming? Back to page 156 on the screen. So once Luther was brought before church and state now, what was his experience as he felt the, the burden, the crisis hour had come? How did he feel? Well, he felt inadequate to meet the trial. He felt his faith was wavering at that time. He was, he was trembling, you know. Let's read that. Because our words cannot really give it justice, Hillary. Read that for us. The next day. The next day he was to appear to render his final answer. For a time his heart sank within him as he contemplated the forces that were combined against the truth. His faith faltered. Fearfulness and trembling came upon him and horror overwhelmed him. Dangers multiplied before him. His enemies seemed about to triumph mm. and the powers of darkness to prevail. Mm. Clouds gathered about him and seemed to separate him from God. He longed for the assurance that the Lord of hosts would be with him. In anguish of spirit, he threw himself with his face upon the earth and poured out those broken, heart-rending cries which none but God can fully understand. You know, when I read that, I sit out of my seat, mm -hmm. on my knees, and I said, Lord, please give me that experience because I have to have it before the son the law is in force. Mm -hmm. I said, Lord, give it to my wife. Give it to my children. Do you all want it, friends? Now, what comes to mind as you, as you heard those words, as you read those words, in anguish of spirit, mm -hmm. he threw, okay. I, Amen. Amen. Before I finish reading it. Who? who what? Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. Gethsemane. And notice, yes, drops of blood in Gethsemane. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And this was before who came to capture Christ? Church and state. That's it. So Christ said to the disciples, watch and pray. pray. Without this experience, you're not ready for church and state mm -hmm. crisis. You're not ready for it. And you see, and Peter at this point, he was very self-confident. And you see a clear contrast, a yes. marked contrast yes. with Martin Luther. He didn't have that self-assurance that, you know, though all men forsake thee, I will be here. I'm going to stand for God. He felt his inadequacy, yes. and it led him to a Gethsemane experience. Yes. It led him to a Jacob-like experience. But Peter, he was too self-confident. Every time Christ would bring up the crisis, be it far from thee, Lord, the first, one of the first times, then when he would bring it back again, though all men shall forsake thee, I will not do it. I will not do it. He was putting confidence in himself. And we read some previous statements that Martin Luther had said, you know, before he was to face the diet. Um, how bold he was. How bold he was. I will enter the mouth of the behemoth and I will break his teeth. And, you know, but here you see a difference. You know, you see he really felt inadequate. He knew that it wasn't in his own strength that he could stand. No way. And sometimes we look at Martin Luther, like myself, as this great champion. Sometimes we almost give him like a supernatural uh, quality so to speak, like he wasn't human. But I'm so glad that the great controversy brought this out because he wasn't Christ. You know, he wasn't at an, at, at an advantage that we don't have. He was human too, subject to the same, you know, um, like passions, feeling, like passions yes. and feelings. And we see here what his experience was. His feelings of inadequacy drove him to his knees, to a, an agonizing experience with Christ. Praise the Lord for that statement. I'll just say this. Just to magnify the book, Great Controversy. So this book not only show us the crisis, mm -hmm. but embedded in these chapters is the experience. Amen. Amen. So it's more than just showing current events, current events, prophecies being fulfilled. A Sunday law is near, but look at the experience. experience. Amen. Next paragraph, Hillary. Mm -hmm. 
An all-wise providence had permitted Luther to realize his peril, that he might not trust to his own strength and rush presumptuously into danger. Yet it was not the fear of personal suffering, a dread of torture or death, which seemed immediately impending, that overwhelmed him with its terror. He had come to the crisis, mm. and he felt his insufficiency to meet it. Pause right there. Who also came to a crisis and felt insufficient to meet that crisis? Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh, my friends. Yes. Yes. And the next few lines said that also somebody else came to a crisis, Old Testament, and f felt insufficient yep. to, to meet it. Who was this? Jacob. Read that for us, Hillary. Not for his own safety. Blue words. Not for his own safety, but for the triumph of the gospel did he wrestle with God. Like Israel's in that night struggle, beside the lonely stream was the anguish and conflict of his soul. Like Israel, he prevailed with God. In his utter helplessness, his faith fastened upon Christ, the mighty deliverer. He was strengthened with the assurance that he would not appear alone before the council. Peace, peace returned to his soul. And rejoiced. And he rejoiced that he was permitted to uplift the word of God before the rulers of the nations. And what did Christ receive before Judas came? Wow, an, an angel oh. strengthening him. And a, a peace came over him. No longer was he bleeding, um, Great drops perspiring, of, right. blood. The peace came over him now. Mm -hmm. You know, friends, the thought, the, thought, the thought that came to my mind was this. How could you rip out these chapters from the book Great Controversy wow. and give me great hope? How could that be hope? Hmm. When you remove these chapters, it's a false hope. It's a lie. Because these chapters right. give you the hope. It gives you the controversy and it gives you the hope. The great hope only gives you the false hope. It doesn't even give you the, the, the full scope of the controversy. As Luther was walking into now the, the hall, the council, church and state, what words did God allow to come to his ears to encourage him, to strengthen him? What words? The promises of the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And specifically mm -hmm. on the screen, 155, great controversy. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to do what? Kill the soul. These were the words that strengthened Luther in the time of crisis. Amen. Let's fast forward. So now he's brought before church and state now to give his final answer. Listen to what he said now. When they brought his books, right? Mm -hmm. And say, are these your writings? Will you recant? Listen to what Luther said. And before we read this, I want to ask you a question. When you hear and read this, ask yourself, if we are going to repeat this experience of Luther, does it not imply that his ministry must also be ours? Oh, yes. And his way of doing ministry must also be ours. Definitely. Read that for us, page 158. Then proceeding to the question, he stated that his published works were not all of the same character. In some, he had treated of faith and good works, and even his enemies declared them not only harmless, but profitable. To retract these would be to condemn truths which all parties confessed. The, the second, second class. class consisted of writings exposing the corruptions and abuses of the papacy. Read on. To revoke these works would strengthen the tyranny of Rome and open a wider door to many and great impieties. So did he revolt the words he wrote and preach against the abomination of the papacy? No, not then at all. Then why are we hearing men write, we have no beef wow. with Pope Francis? Or we should apologize. Or we must apologize to, to Pope, Pope Francis, Francis for mailing out the book Great Controversy. Could these men be the Luthers? For the last days? No. Oh, no. my friends. But beside that, what about us? Are we afraid to lay open the sins of the papacy? Because we are afraid to be labeled falsely as fanatics, hmm. extremists? Oh, for the faith of Christ and Luther. Read on. The mm -hmm. third class, Hillary. In the third class of his books, he had attacked individuals who had defended existing evils. 
Concerning these, he freely confessed that he had been more violent than was becoming. He did not claim to be free from fault, but even these books he could not revoke, for such a course would embolden the enemies of truth, and they would then take occasion to crush God's people with still greater cruelty. So what was contained in that third class of books? Well, he pointed the finger on individuals that were carrying out the abominations and the iniquities. And did he revolt that? No, he couldn't. Did he retract? No. Why not? Because it would further even, embolden it, yes, the enemies yes, of the truth, of the faith. Friends, when I read these, I said, Lord, help me to be found faithful and help me to present your word with the right spirit in the right manner. But even, even your, I mean, look at Christ. Who could have presented truth more clearly, more forcefully than Jesus? Mm -hmm. And yet they call Jesus a man possessed with Beelzebub. Right. Yeah. Come on. They said Jesus never suppressed one word of truth, but he always uttered, in it, in, uttered it in love. And tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. In the last few, in the last few slides, I'm going to hurry this along. I'm going somewhere to close on this point. When Luther made that statement now, his last answer now, mm -hmm. what was the impact of his message? Wow. Well, there were some, many actually, who accepted it. They saw the, the light in it. They saw the truth at it, in it. And they heard it in two languages because providentially he was allowed to present it twice. And so for those who were hearing it for the second time, they were convicted even deeper. But there were others, of course, that maybe saw the truth, but they turned away from it, rejected it. Rejected and, it. and this, and Sister Y quoted three persons in Scripture mm -hmm. who heard Paul delivering his message and yet rejected. Who were they? Agrippa, Felix, Felix Festus, Festus and, Agrippa. and Agrippa. Will they be found again in the last days? Absolutely. Look at this, my friends. And then once the meeting was over, what was restricted? What was, uh, re what was removed from Luther? His safe conduct. And all of his rights, really. All of his rights So that were means, revoked. watch carefully now. That means once the Sunday law is enforced mm -hmm. and we stand before church and state and we give up that testimony for God, some will accept. Mm -hmm. The majority will reject. The next thing is all of our rights will be what? Revoked. Revoked. And what will be announced and pronounced upon us? A the death, death decree. decree. Wow. It's right there on page 167. The mm -hmm. death decree. However, who did God work through to preserve his champion, modern day David for that day, Luther? Mm -hmm. Who did God work through? The man called Frederick of Saxony. Praise God. And what did Frederick do? Um, fr friends, I'm going somewhere here now. What did Frederick of Saxony do? Well, he led him to safety in so many words. Allowed <laughs> men to literally capture him, mm -hmm. bring him, bring him to into safety. safety. When I read that, Luther was hid from the uh, sword of the papists. Mm -hmm. When I read that, I went back to the church looking at where Luther's experience will be fulfilled again. Sunday law, God's people are sealed, mm -hmm. receive laddering, give the loud cry. Souls are brought in. We stand before church and state. We give that last testimony. God's All people right. deliver. And then we see that there's going to be a death decree. Right. They'll be hunting us. And as Frederick of Saxony was used by God to preserve Luther, volume 9 of the testimonies. And page 16 says that God is going to allow angels wow. to preserve us. Amen. It says on page 16, by means, wait a minute, yes, by means, well, it says, just the line before the red words, God's people will walk, this is a Sunday law crisis, God's people will walk in the light, proceeding from where? The throne of God. What is that light from God's throne? Laterine, loud cry, the Shekinah glory. Mm -hmm. By means of the angels, there will be what? Constant. constant communication between heaven and earth. Can you imagine? 
angels will be directing us wow. as we're going to evangelize the world, as we're going through the mountain, the caverns, the, the caves, angels will be Praise by the our Lord. side. Amen. Praise God for that. Yes. But there'll be no angels by our side then unless we allow the angels to find in our homes, in our hearts, a dwelling place. Hmm. What do you say, my friends? Amen. All right. And once God hid Luther, was it a blessing? Oh, it was a blessing, a tremendous blessing. Now, most of you read it. When God hid Luther, what happened? What blessings came out of God hiding Luther? It, <laughs> translate the Bible. All right. <laughs> He was allowed the German tongue. to translate the New Testament into the German tongue. So he gave them the what then? The sword of the spirit. Amen. Number two, he kept on writing. writing. All right, number three now. He was now shielded, shielded from pride and Why? exaltation. Why? Well, because after he gave his testimony before the diet, a lot of people really saw the truth of his cause and they really wanted to help. And you know how human flesh is. That's they it. like to flatter and uplift the instrument, you know. And so in order to preserve Luther from that pride and self-exaltation, he was hidden away from, from that. Go to 1 Peter with me. 1 Peter chapter 3. Where are we going to, my friends? So are we heading for a time of church and state? Yes. Church and state. In 1 Peter chapter 3, how are we to be ready? Sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. So while we're going through the experience of Christ and Luther, wait a minute. Didn't we just preach Christ's experience? Absolutely. From the book Great Controversy? Definitely. Did we? Right. Did we just preach Christ? And him crucified. Yes. His experience along with the coming crisis. Did we just hear present truth? Amen. Along with these experiences, we're going to close right here. Look at verse 15 of 1 Peter 3. Hillary, what it says here. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, look at the screen here. So must we get ready? Yes. Must the word of God be hid in our hearts? Yes. That we might share when we are called to share God's word. Amen. Note this statement. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 707. What it says here, Hillary? And there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe. But until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as true. Pause right there. What is that saying? All of us will be what? Brought before? Councils, churches, and also state governors, exactly, exactly. kings. And how will we have to stand? Singly and alone. Oh, how did Christ stand? Singly and alone. Luther stand? Yes, yeah, singly Is and that alone. strength available for us? It is. Now, now it is. this next slide, I put it right here, this quotation, because many young people think it's only the adults who must get this experience in order to stand. But this statement is coming from messages to young people which says young people, the youth, must also have this experience to stand before church and state. Wow. Look at this statement, page 186. Now, just get the blue words right there. You know not where you may be called upon to give your witness of truth. Many will have to stand in the legislative courts. Some will have to stand before kings and before the learned of the earth to answer for their faith. Red words. Let no one imagine that he has no need to study because he is not to preach in the sacred desk. You know not what God may require of you. So what is that saying right there, Hillary? We all have to be prepared, no, young no, and just old. Just the pastor. No. Just the elder. Not at all. Everybody. Just the Bible worker. Everybody. Just the medical missionary. No. Everybody. Just, just the adults. No. The children, too, because I'm... I'm brought back to the account of Daniel and his three friends. They had to stand. Did, were they brought before the king's courts? Yes, they were. Did they have to stand? They had to stand. And when the test came in Daniel chapter 3, did they stand? Because they took a stand on the word of God. Joseph? Yep, same how, thing. How old were they? Young, Young men. Young. They had to stand. 
Now, friends, write this statement down. I'm going to quote. I'm closing right here. Write this statement down. We are told in the book, oh, you know what? I'm going to give this to you on your handout. But we are told, in order for us to stand in these last days, walk around with your Bibles. Now, it's in last day events, but also in Review and Herald. Sister White says, make sure you have a pocket Bible wherever you are. And commit a text to memory daily that spiritual life may exist in your soul. So when you are brought before kings, and she says, watch carefully. Now, when Luther was brought before kings and churchmen, mm -hmm. he had the books there. But we are told, oh, I wish I had this on the slide. It says here, watch carefully, it says... In the book, Last Day Events, page 67. But it's really coming from Manuscript Releases, volume 20, page 64. The time will come when many will be deprived of the written word. Wow. But if this word is printed in the memory, no one can take it from us. How then can God bring back to our memory what we have not stored there? In closing, friends, now, this last statement says, all of us will be brought before the modern-day diet, church and state, right? Mm -hmm. Watch carefully. Sister White says, movements are now being afoot to bring Seventh-day Adventists to the forefront. Look at, this, look at the screen right here. That's volume 5, page 546. Paragraph 2, she says, events, movements are now being set in place to usher Seventh-day Adventists to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And we will have to give a reason for our faith. What recent events can you, recent now, can you say, yes, that is one, that is one, that has now brought Seventh-day Adventists in the spotlight? What events? Well, Ben Carson's running for the presidency is one thing. Ben Carson. And mm -hmm. if you remember, when Trump stood up during the campaign and he, 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 he bent over his podium and said, I'm Presbyterian. Some folks don't believe. I'm Presbyterian. And he said, folks, that's in the middle of the road. And then he said, but... Ben Carson, a Seventh-day Adventist, folks, we don't know who those people are. In other words, it was a cheap shot, as it were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was scoffing, mockery. Right. If Presbyterians are in the middle of the road, these people, who are they? They're either far left or far right. <laughs> who are they? Right. All right. Mm -hmm. And lastly, do you remember when Trump... Some people call it the travel ban on Muslims, and some call it, some folks called it um, the travel restrictions. A religious ban, a ban whatever, of Muslims. Whatever they called it. If you remember on uh, that Sunday morning CBS uh, news program, it was a congressman. Do you remember his name? Keith Ellison. Keith Ellison. Thank you so much. He said, if they, if they can ban Muslims, his words, soon, who else will they ban? Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists. Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists. Lumped together, mm -hmm. falsely, with Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. Based on scripture, we can't, we can't group. That's apples and something else, my friends. Spinach. Spin no, no, no. We eat spinach. That's apples oh. and cyanide. Oh, okay. <laughs> they don't mix. Amen? Amen? But the point here is events are now being put in place to bring Seventh-day Adventists to the forefront. Am I ready? Are we ready? Do we have the Gethsemane experience? Mm. Are we studying for ourselves? Where do we go, go to church? What are we studying? That's why we're going through the book, Great Controversy. Let's get ready. Let's prepare ourselves, my friends. Go back over our notes. And by God's grace, let's stand in his strength. And if life should last, we'll come back next week and go forward in our series. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, 
we're thankful this evening for this study. It was clear. It was concise yet precise. We want to be found faithful. We want to vindicate your character. As you stood and stood alone for us, we want to stand. And if alone, that we will vindicate your character. Knowing, humanly speaking, we are alone. But we are not alone because we have Christ by our side. The holy angels by our side. As you did for Elijah, do for us. As you did for Martin Luther, do for us. Save us. Every name that was mentioned, especially those within the Seventh Day Adventist movement, we pray that they will surrender all to you. Oh dear God, let us as your people stand to be the watchmen on the walls of Zion, preparing the sheep, the lamb, to be faithful messengers in these last days. We thank you for hearing us. We thank you for answering. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, friends. I want to thank you again for joining us this evening for our prophetic insights. Let's prepare ourselves for chapter 9 in the book Great Controversy next week, Thursday at 7.30 p.m. And please join us this coming Sabbath at 11.30 a.m. God bless until we meet again.